Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I know you've been uh, extended on your seats. Um, so free welcome to jump up and down in my presentation. Um, my job is to, um, to indicate how easy it is to obtain a home loan from a bank. And I think that might answer some of the questions that we just had. Just a little bit of background on, um, on, on Green Door. Green Door is an independent um, bond regeneration company, and we're very proud to be associated with P3, um, looking after their clients, ensuring and making the best available uh, outcome or secure outcome from the banks. Now, um, we do have bankers in the audience, um, so usually I'll give a, a couple of free tips, but um, having my my colleagues from the, from the banks here, I'll, I, I might need to refrain from, uh, from saying some stuff that we'll usually do in the office. So uh, you'll have my telephone number afterwards and, and you're welcome to phone if you need one of those tips. But nevertheless, only it's, it's, it's great to see um, APSA's um, participation here as well. Now I was um, requested um, to talk a little bit about the lending criteria and considerations from a bank point of view. And that's exactly what I'm, what I'm going to do. Firstly, to make use of a bond originator, uh, our value proposition is expertise. Marita and myself are the directors of our company. Since 2005, we have extended um, uh, uh, work relations with, with uh, specifically with APSA as well. Um, and then decided to start it, uh, our own, own business. Now, so expertise, we know what the banks want. We in contact with them on a daily basis. Um, sometimes we share their pain and sometimes we share their joy. But the biggest single uh, value proposition is a single entry point. You don't need to run from bank to bank to bank with different requirements from the bank in order to obtain your home loan. It's a single point of entry. We use our expertise and our negotiation skills with the banks because we understand what the bank wants. Um, just quickly on the banks, we deal with all the banks from APSA, FMB, Housing, Standard Bank, NetBank, RMB, Investec, and HIP Housing, and, and SA Home Loans. So you can see we have a, a vast um, choice um, that we can see where is the best possible, the best possibility to suit your needs. Because we all know that the banks differ in terms of their requirements, their policies, their appetite for business. And um, it makes our job easier um, to understand that and then to place you at the right um, or to introduce you to one or two banks that, that, that will uh, focus on your business. Just hip housing for interest in sake, that's more for the entry level. Um, that's a collaboration between the National Housing Finance Corporation with Old Mutual as their funders. Now, before I start my presentation, um, this is the view that the seller have his, of his property. The next one, that's the buyer's view. They always think they're paying too much. And then when the bank gets involved, that's the bank's view. And then obviously when the values go out, that's what they find. So uh, that is what we are dealing with in terms of, uh, of, of the different views from the bank. Maybe not that serious, but that's a little bit uh, tongue in the cheek. Now. Home loans as a, as a model within the banks, the impression, and I've heard, I've listened to some of the questions, the impression might be that banks does not, do not want to do business in terms of home loans. That's not true. We are doing a lot of home loan business with the banks. The, the, the home loan is a core product of the bank and they are looking after it like gold. So they will attach all the bells and whistles. You'll find more and more that banks says, okay, I'll give you a home loan, but now I want your, I want your other business as well. Uh, obviously, there's a, a seasonal uh, variation and an appetite. I'm not referring to winter, summer, or whatever. It used to be a little dip in the winter months, obviously, because the, uh, the attractability of a property for buyers is not always um, that conducive. But we found the last couple of years that um, if we look at winter, summer, whenever, that there's, a, um, th that there's an average um, interest in buying a house at any time. Now, the banks are looking at, at, at a couple of, uh, the makeup of a bank, uh, looking at a couple of things, and I must stress once again, it differs from one bank to the other. You'll hardly find, and that's why we have a value proposition, that, that's why I have a job. It's because the banks are, diff are uh, vastly different 
in the dis decision making. And you'll find that one bank will tweak something on their credit scoring system and the other banks will loosen it at the same time. But it all depends on the, on the um, exposure, not only exposure in certain areas, but that's one of the things that they, that they do look at. Um, Someone asked me the other day, does that refer to redlining? No, that's a swear word in banking. There is no redlining. But exposure in certain areas, and especially when we come to developments, and I'll um, talk a little bit about that later on, that, that can play a role. Then um, banks, I've, I've mentioned the tweak in the systems, um, when and how they, they see fit. Now the main considerations when a bank look at an application or consider an application is obviously the credit record and the profile of the buyer. Um, there are certain ways and means that we can do a lot of homework up front before you buy that property to ensure that we put you in a, in a good place where the bank will consider you for a home loan. Maybe not for a hundred percent, but maybe for a 90 or 80 percent bond, but um, we all, always endeavor to give the client a positive outcome from a bank. No is not an answer, unfortunately. Sorry, Anli, and you know that by now. Um, affordability, and I've heard that um, also in Jacques' presentation a lot. Affordability, unfortunately, is one of the main things that the bank will, will take consideration in, and that's usually where we get a negative answer from, is on affordability. And I have a couple of tips that we need to look at how to enhance your affordability. And then obviously your net spendable income, that's your gross income after your, your deductions. Um, we refer to that as net spendable income. In other words, your take home pay. How much money do you have left in your pocket to pay a bond, to pay a car, to pay your, your, uh, the schools, the groceries and whatever. So those three uh, components is the main factors that, that we take in consideration when we, um, when we assess your home loan. Now, one of the main things, and I think the, um, um, my learned colleague here will know better, but I think there's about 52% of all consumers have an impaired credit record. It's more or less in that region. Yeah, just a little bit below that, but uh, um, still relative. Almost there. That's because I work with them every day. It feels like 60%, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, a credit record, um, people, is, is, is the, the most important thing next to your own integrity. If there's any blip on your credit record, it will reflect and it will have a ripple effect on, on anything that you do. Now, unfortunately, and I refer to affordability, and I've heard a question here as well, and I've heard it lots of times, that I had no problem in buying a motor vehicle. Why is the bank full of crap granting me um, a home loan? The other one is, I just got a loan, an unsecured loan from Capitec or Bank of Africa, well, maybe not, not African Bank anymore, but uh, <laughs> we'll leave that one, of, of 120,000. How come a bank don't want to give me a secured loan for 800,000? They've got the property, they've got the security, yet they have all these questions. Now, those are the issues that, that we need to address. Firstly, in my view, one of the biggest culprits in terms of affordability is the willy-nilly way that banks and other scrupulous operators are giving short-term unsecured loans. Even credit cards, the banks are guilty in terms of credit cards as, as well. Whenever we assess an application before it goes to banks and we get a credit profile from a client, you sometimes will find that, that the person has five credit cards and he's got six short-term loans. Now all of those short-term debt and must be repaid. And that plays a huge role in terms of the affordability. So instead of working smarter in terms of where and what money you borrow and channel that into, into, um, into a, a home loan payment, uh, unfortunately, that's not the way everyone thinks. But I'll touch on it a little bit later as well. So yes, guys, pay your bills on time. Manage your debt. Be steadfast. The banks have credit systems, and the next slide will, will elaborate on that, where they touch on everything in our lives. How many people do we do stay in our house? Do we have a landline? I mean, thank, I think some of the banks took that requirement away recently, because we all said there's no more landlines. People are now carrying their telephone in their, in their hands. So how can you score us on not having a landline? But that's as nitty gritty as it got. If you had a, a landline, the better your score is. 
And the reason for that, they want to see that you stay fast, that you are committed to, 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 to the place where you stay. They look at your time at an at, at, uh, employee. How long have you worked at an employee? So should we get an application where the client worked five years or 10 years for one employee, they've moved to Pretoria to a new job, now we need to declare to the bank this guy is only in Pretoria for a month. But that needs to be communicated to the bank. The days when a bond originated just fill in an application form and zapped it off to the bank, expect a positive answer as long and gone. You need to be, have an expert bond originator at your side to look at all these nitty gritty things to ensure that you get the best possible outcome. And then, a big thing. We had loans or bonds retracted by the banks a month after they've granted you a home loan. Why? Because they do these, these random checks on applications that's been granted. And if they found that you bought a car before that bond is registered, or that, that you uh, got an, uh, a 200,000, created a 200,000 debt somewhere, and in their view, it's impacting on your affordability, and that your affordability has changed from when the assessment was done, they will retract your bond, and they're entitled to do it. So guys, just be very careful, especially you guys that invest in property. You know that you want to invest in a property. You know by when. You know exactly you have purpose. You've mentioned those things. So refrain from, refrain from buying the, the ML or the Porsche. <laughs> Buy your property first and then refrain from buying the ML once you've got the bond because the bank will pick it up. All right. Um, yes, then we can move on. Factors that will affect your scoring, and now I refer to scoring. Each bank has its own scoring system. And some things are more important to a bank than to APSA and to Standard Bank and NetBank. They all differ. So it's difficult to say what those things are. And believe me, we get answers from the bank when we, they say it's, it's declined for scoring. Now, decline for scoring is as big as the universe. And then to try and get a bank to tell you exactly what impacted on that scoring is extremely difficult. So from our point of view, these pointers that I'm giving you are the main things. Because once a bank say the client has been declined for scoring, you know it could be anything from A to Z. Um, so late payments or no payments of accounts, it's a no-go. Dishonored items on a bank account. Now we do pick up, sometimes you, uh, you put a stop payment to a policy or, or, or something, the bank will, will view it as a, as a sent back item, maybe not a dishonored item, but it will reflect on your credit profile. So we need to, we need to know about it so that we can tell the bank, the client stopped his sometime policy because he got a new um, insurer or whatever the case is. Those are small things that has a huge impact on, on the outcome of your um, of your, of your uh, application. Regular credit checks. Each South African citizen is entitled to one free credit check yearly. So do make use of it. Some of, some of us are too afraid to go and check. It's like to, it's like to go and check your bank balance. You know it's negative, but you don't want to check it's ne negative. Okay. So, so, yes, sir. Can you, if I phone you and say, can you do it, my, can you get my credit policy or my, my sorry, not policy, my credit portfolio, yes. can you do it for me? Because I actually haven't seen my own, funny enough. I can do, I it. I can do it. The next slide I'm going to show you. I want to All right. Thank you. So you can do your own regular credit check. You are entitled to one free credit check. So do make use of it. Uh, and then a small thing like dependence in households. Now, that's only where you must close your ears. Okay. Um, the, even the dependence in your household is important. So if you have five children, don't need to tell the bank you've got five children. Just tell them you've got three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. And the reason for that, guys, is simple. Uh, the banks have built in, in their credit scoring, to say, if you are 45 years old, and you're in a management position, and you stay in Moraleta Park, 
and you have two vehicles and your wife work and your five children. This is the estimate expense. Whether you put down the 800 rand for groceries for you and five children, <laughs> it's not going to work with the bank because in their view, scientifically, they have an average to say that profile person can only get away with this expense. Okay. So, those, yes, sir. Regularly. Yeah, or is it a bad thing in the context of what you said that uh, every citizen is entitled to only one yes. free check bank? Yes. So if I do it every month, is it a good thing for my scoring or is it a bad thing? It will not be a good thing for your scoring, and I'm going to tell you the next slide. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit, but it's a good question. So, yes, yeah, so even the dependence on your, um, in terms of household, plays a vital role. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to check. I mean, if I'm a 50 year old and I'm staying alone, I've got no dependents. I mean, yes. if they look at the profile and say yeah. it's 50 years, this check can't be alone. But I'm, I'm not staying alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fact. I mean, <laughs> that's a fact. So, yes, now you're in a good position because you're earning your money for yourself. So, they shouldn't, you, you don't have expenses. Now, sometimes the bank does not like someone not to have expenses or not to have debt. And that's a fact. Yes. You must have debt because they want a credit record. Yeah. And you must have expenses. Otherwise, they think, what, why? Now, on that point, if you are alone and you earn 50 grand in a month and you have no assets to show for it, the banks will ask questions to say, what are you doing with 20 grand a month? Do you have it in a policy? Is the investments? Do you have own properties or whatever? So we need to be careful when we re relay that information to the bank to say, but this guy stays alone. But what happens to his excess or his, his savings? We need to prove that this guy has prof uh, uh, assets to, uh, to show for that money. Okay. Now banks are using internal, in, uh, like I just explained, um, and external credit scoring. Um, the ex external credit scoring, there's, there's five or six um, credit bureaus. Banks uh, make a use of different um, or sometimes two of those credit bureaus and the most common is ITC and Experian um, and those are the ones that you can have a view on once a year. We make use, uh, okay, not yet, uh, externally, yes, they rely on, a, on the external um, credit bureaus because that gives, gives the bank a view of what your money matters look like. Because that profile um, gives them an idea of, it confirms how old you are, it confirms where you stay, it confirms where you work, where you have worked, it confirms whether you have directorships in companies, because that's an important um, thing for the banks, because, and I'll, a little bit later as well, if they pick up your director, they immediately think that you're self-employed. That needs to be explained to the bank. Some of us earn, uh, own small companies as a sideline, but you have a full-time job. So we, you need to tell the bank that, otherwise they will view it that you're self-employed. And that changed the whole, the whole game plan as far as an application is concerned. And then, okay, I've touched on the external scoring um, of the banks as well. Now, in terms of the scoring of your, of your application, there's always a pre-screen pre process from a bank. Um, I always fight with my staff to say, when you give feedback to our clients, don't use the jargon that we get from the banks, because the client will not understand the jargon. Be, be precise and elaborate on, on exactly what the banks come back with. But the electronic screening process will do an initial credit check internally and then obviously externally. If they pick up the something, they will either decline the application up front within Sometimes within 30 seconds, you push the hit button and before you can even fax the, the documents, the answer will come back and say decline. But we do have an answer for that as well. And then after that, you need to, to pass a basic auto process within the bank. And they, sometimes they refer to scoring and you might have had feedback, those of you who have bought properties to say, your scoring is too high, your scoring is too low or whatever the case is. We do have a feel for what that scoring is and we how you can manage that scoring. And then obviously, if it's not a vanilla application, 
that application becomes a manual application. Now, by manual, I mean it now needs to be manually be referred by a bank to the credit guys. Then you add two, three, four, five, six days because now it's in the hands of people to push file from file from file. And that's where the bond originator plays a big role in terms of um, ensuring that the agreed service level agreements that we have with the bank to say, guys, you have two days. You, you said you have two days to do X and you have three days to make this decision. We need to keep our, um, our um, clients and our agents and our developers up to date on that SLAs. All right. Uh, suffice to say that self-employed applications and, um, and business applications does not get scored automatically, okay? Because there's financial statements involved and it's a different interpretation of that application as a whole. So if you're self-employed, yes, um, you can add three or four, five days um, to the turnaround time of expecting an answer from the bank as well. Now the role of the credit bureaus, um, there's various companies as I've mentioned. What do, they mean, what, what do they mean to us? They give us the information that we need and that we can interpret it correctly because everyone interprets certain stuff differently. Now, the information we get from the bank, and that's a credit profile, is about 12 pages long. We deal with a company, it's called Lucid. Why do we deal with Lucid and not with the others? Because Lucid does not leave a footprint on your credit record. So I can take a weekly credit record uh, or profile on your on the lucid on your name it will not leave a footprint and by footprint i mean it does not have an effect on your scoring i've seen guys that's bought the motor vehicle and that motor vehicle will be financed by the the application will be sent to six or seven uh, finance companies and each one will do an itc and you'll see the effect a week or two later on your scoring after all those credit checks have been done by those guys that, that, um, that, that were checking out your credit bureau. So be very careful, wherever you, you do credit, you will, you will be checked on ITC Experian and the others. Okay. Um, as part of our value proposition, we do a Lucid. It's a 12-page um, document, 13-page document, that will give us exactly what the same information that the banks will see. In other words, I will see how many accounts you've got, what are your outstanding balances on those accounts are? What are your monthly repayments on those, um, on those accounts are? And for 24 months, I'll have a record to see how frequently do you pay those accounts or not. Because all of those things will have an impact on your scoring when it hits the bank. And it does not help to send an application into the bank and find out later that these issues on, on you as a client. We need to prepare the application and then send a proper application motivated to the bank and they will understand, they read these things. If I tell them the ECUS account is in arrears of 400 Rand, but here's the proof, the client paid it in full yesterday, they will say it's a once off, it's fine, they're happy and they will, do, and they will consider the loan accordingly. So the, the role of the credit bureau plays as big a role in your life as to us and the banks to interpret um, where you stand financially. And it has an impact on your affordability as well, because, um, and you will laugh again, but sometimes like the 800 rand um, uh, grocery thing, you'll find that someone says, but he's only paying a thousand rand on, um, on a credit card uh, expense. But when we get the Lucid, it will show us you've got four credit cards and you, and you invest about 20,000 a month of your money on that credit card. And then there's small things to take in consideration. Some of us buy our groceries on, uh, on credit cards. Then we need to tell the bank and show them that you're buying uh, uh, groceries on your credit card. Otherwise, they will duplicate the, um, the expense because they will say, but you are buying groceries. You don't have an expense in for groceries, so we need to tell them, this is how you buy groceries. So there's a, little, a lot of small things that you need to be prepared for um, before you send it into the bank. When applying for your home loan, know your credit status and we can do it for you. Um, we have a, um, a, a program called BT Mobi, and as you sit here, I can tell you what your credit status is within 30 seconds. Not an elaboration of what's wrong. It will tell me you're okay, or you're slightly 
borderline, or there might be a red cross at say age. Okay. And when we have that information, then we'll go into the Lucid on the full, full credit um, profile to go and see exactly what the challenge is, because you'll find many of our clients will say, but I never knew about it. Okay, so we need to address those things. The pre-purchase qualifier is paramount in today's uh, application for a home loan. We do that, we use the, the Lucid um, report, and we pre prepare a pre-qualification for you to tell you 99.89, like Jacques said, and we're not precise, um, to say, this is what you would qualify for. And we take different things in consideration. We do take in consideration that you have properties, um, investment properties. We need to take that um, blootstelling, uh, exposure in, in, in consideration, because the bank will look at your total home loan exposure, all four properties, what the repayments are on that, and what income is generated from that in terms of um, getting to a, a feasible um, a sum to determine whether you do qualify for a new bond or not. Then bond originating versus going to your bank yourself. Close your ears. <laughs> no, they are very supportive of bond origination, apps I must say, and be grateful for that. Um, yes, as I said, my value proposition is you might have a personal banker, but as one entry point. I'm there to give you choice to tell you what the other bank can, can do. So, I'm not saying do not go to your own banker. If, if you have a trust relationship with your personal banker, that shop, that's, that's, that's good. But one thing I can guarantee is that you will get no preference service from that banker or from home loans. They deal with the same, with the same structures that we as bond originators are dealing. We will fight the same fight in terms of the best interest rate, the best loan conditions or whatever than your personal banker. But if there's a relationship, by all means, but all we ask is give us a shot at the other banks. And you might be surprised, we might come back to you with an answer three, four, five days before your banker even said hello or I got your application. <laughs> and that's a fact. And then positioning yourself for multiple home loans, because that is uh, what, what many of you um, are planning or the situation you're in. Uh, it's important when you come talk to us to bring us a, a, a portfolio of your existing home loans, the, the, the portfolio, to tell us where, at which banks your, um, your bonds are, what the repayments terms are, and those kind of things. I hope those are not bankers. That's why I left. <laughs> Right, the bank credit policies, just very quickly, these terms 20 to 30, to 30 years, uh, a bank like F&B, not, they're not interested in 30 year terms, they will only um, do 20 year terms. NetBank will do up to 25 and then Apps and Standard Bank up to 30, to 30 years. The age limit is sometimes a challenge, um, not older than 65 and a bond needs to be repaid by 75, that, that's, not, that, that's a general rule. I'm not going to tell you what each bank rule is, but that's a general rule within the, the different banks. And then there's a clear distinction between salaried persons and um, employed or legal uh, employed persons or legal entities because it, it, it's a total different assessment. Um, if you're self-employed, I will need two years financials um, at least. If it's older than six years or six months, I will need management statements. And then me and my team need to sit and assess those um, the financial statements with you or even your bookkeeper. We, we sometimes deal with the accountant straight to the accountant to, um, to get our interpretation right before we uh, motivate it to the banks. Uh, purchase price or valuation, whatever is the lowest. Um, sometimes you buy a, a bargain in the marketplace, way under the, the value, but the banks will only assess it on the purchase price or the valuation, whatever is the lowest. Um, the banks do give 100% loans to salaried uh, people up to 100%. Up to That's a very important concept. They will always, always tell you, we, we don't give 100% loans, we give up to 100% loans. So you can read in it what you want. And in self-employed and business uh, um, uh, applications, that depend on, on loan size. The banks have certain uh, brackets in terms of 100%, 90%, 80%. Um, the lower percentage or the higher loan, the lower um, percent, uh, loan to value percentage the banks will grant you. But that varies from about 70 to 100%. On trust applications, um, 
Absent FMB will assess 80 percent, and I know you guys are dealing um, the concept that you'll hear later or know about. Um, um, entails um, buying in a trust or in a, in a new company. Um, NetBank will do no loans in investment trusts, but only in trading trusts. And Standard Bank up to 90%, but then they want the trust or the trustee to bank with them. So you can see there's, there's different fields and looks to the whole thing. And that's where we come in when we discuss the application with you. We can um, have an idea where best to place um, your bond. On that slide, I just need, um, I've omitted one slide, and that's to do with, um, with self-employed and businesses. Um, the bank will not assess your application if we do not have at least two years financials. So sometimes we get an application, a guy says, okay, now I need to go to my bookkeeper to finalize the financials, and then it brings the whole thing to a standstill, and the bank will usually withdraw your application until such time we can provide those uh, or proper financials. And I'm almost done. The rental income, it's, it's an important part of your lives. Um, the banks that do, not, do not allow future income. So if I buy an investment property and I say, okay, I, I will earn an income from this investment property, the banks will assess your affordability without your, um, with, without your rental income. It might happen that as part of your contract, it states you're buying an investment unit with uh, existing um, uh, rental agreement in place. In those cases, we need to scrutinize the offer to purchase to ensure that it's in place and do certain other checks in place and then try and convince the bank that uh, this is not really future income but it forms part of the transaction, but that can be done as well. Um, I've mentioned the full property profile and... Um, the bank would want to see that you have at least a rental agreement of 12 months and at least three months that there's been a rental income um, on your bank account and that there's at least six months left of your rental agreement. Okay. If it's less than that, we, we usually motivate to say that the rental agreement will be um, extended. Okay. That's my Afrikaans English, so maybe it's not that uh, <laughs> precise. Okay. Rental deposits, I've mentioned in, a, in accounts, some banks are fuzzy, they want the rental account to be in their account to give 100% acknowledgement of that, otherwise they will scale down on the percentage of the income to 60 or 70%, I don't know why, but that's bank rules. Right, and then what track was now? Existing exposure, I've mentioned it, banks will look at your existing exposure in terms of home loans. So if we do a, a pre-qualification, say, okay, you can uh, invest 30,000 of your income in, a, in home loan repayments, and you already have 20,000 in home loan repayments, it means you will only be able to buy for another million for the, the, the additional 10,000 um, repayment that you need to make. So that's what I mean by existing exposure. We do need a look at that. Interest rates, I also heard that, um, obviously is to do with, with, with funding of money and stuff with the bank that Jock will know more than I do, but nevertheless, the banks are in a cycle where they price higher um, to make provision. They, they're borrowing money on shorter terms and obviously that borrowing of funds is, does not come cheaper, it's more expensive money and that uh, filters through to what you will see at the end. But one of our value propositions, once again, up to three times sometimes is to go back to the bank, go back to the bank and provide them with reasons. We don't say the client does not agree with the interest rate, we need to go back to the, the bank and say these are the reasons in our opinion why this client should get a more, benef uh, a more uh, beneficial rate. And the banks are willing to listen, especially now when the things are going tight uh, and we provide another bank's interest rate to say but your own bank gives gives me 12% and another bank that I don't bank with gives me 10%. We go to your own bank first and say, are you prepared to keep your client and to match the right or better the right, whatever the case is. Valuations does play a part in some areas, um, um, but not, it's not a showstopper at all. That I can tell you. Um, we, do, we do speak to the, value, the different valuation departments from the banks time to time um, to get a feel of 
where they view and why they view certain areas maybe as a little bit higher in terms of, of, of um, valuations. And then lastly, new developments. Um, the banks, whenever we take on a new development, like with Unicorn, the banks will say we do a pre-valuation up front with all the banks, and then bank, banks will come back and say, okay, we are happy to be part of this development, but we will commit 30% exposure in this development. Another bank will say 20, 15, or whatever. So, and that's why we're dealing with a whole range of, of um, financial institutions to, to make sure that we can accommodate um, your home loan application 100% at that development. It might happen that NetBank said, I only want a 15% exposure in that development, and once it's reached, we will not be able to extend uh, another loan to NetBank. And sometimes it's your own bank, but that's the reason why we then place uh, or try and place the bond with, um, with another bank. Those are just quickly requirements for an application and a trust. There's a letter of authority, the trust deed. The trustees needs to correspond with what we declare to the bank, please. Um, there is a, there's a resolution that needs to be signed and dated by all trustees who, uh, who are entitled to deal with um, uh, applying for finance. Um, the reference to the independent trustee, usually a bookkeeper or a... a, 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 a uh, uh, auditor, um, that we also need to advise the bank and say, this is not a trustee, it's an independent trustee looking after the well-being of the trust. And then obviously, now these days, we need solvency letters and financials as well. All right, so that is in a nutshell, as quickly as I can keep you here for five hours, because that's, uh, that's what we need to know to keep the banks happy. Uh, that's my contact detail, Marita and Gerrit. Um, you do have um, our business cards on your, um, on your seats as well. And remember, your credit record is everything. Gerrit, bye bye, thank you for the We really appreciate it. And you can phone us anytime. We'll assist. Thank you.